so we're shifting gears uh, somewhat from this uh, super interesting discussion on uh, inequality and urban mobility uh, that Professor Sampson was uh, presenting on. And um, the organizers, I believe, put this panel together because um, in Tartu in particular, it's not um, uh, just the data analytics behind mobility that's very important, but it's this very conscientious policy making and planning to shift mobility towards more sustainable modes. Tartu is one Estonian city that has been making perhaps the greatest um, efforts, in my opinion, to um, uh, make uh, a sustainable mobility, mobility transition truly palpable. Um, and um, has uh, put in place some rather impressive measures. Um, for instance, uh, Tartu has entirely uh, revamped its bus network in the last few years, uh, transitioned to biofuel buses. Um, it has implemented a very well utilized shared bike program um, in the city. Uh, in fact, per capita basis or per bike basis, if we may say so, I think it's one of the most utilized shared bike networks in the whole world. Um, it has uh, created a citywide bike network, uh, upgraded a number of streets, including some we've experienced like Uligoli or uh, University Street, Vanamuise Street. Uh, it shuts down uh, one of the main traffic arteries in the summer, uh, which is called Auto Vabatuse Buyeste or Freedom Avenue, which is or Car Free Avenue to be precise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's lots of uh, very visible um, and tangible efforts in place. But despite all of this, uh, even in a place like Tartu, we still see uh, the, it very difficult to actually make a difference in the modal split. We still see uh, the vehicle-driven modal share uh, slightly even increasing. And I think I was very delighted to see this new accessibility tool that the university has helped develop for the city to see a daily modal split statistics about uh, current movements. Uh, but so my first question to the panel really is about um, if you take all of these things that Tartu has been doing, and in the context of Estonia, it's really quite impressive compared to Tallinn or, or other cities. Uh, and with all these efforts, we're still finding it very difficult to make a real difference, not just in the visible projects we all experience, but into the actual modal share that is the real goal. And the city's um, official policies are to shift modal share uh, such that the driving would decrease uh, close to 40% by 2030. That is an extremely ambitious goal, and I'm sure other European cities that are uh, striving to achieve sustainable mobility have similar goals. What needs to happen beyond what is already happening? What is missing? What does the city have to do? What does the research community have to do to actually move us to real change? Uh, we can open it up maybe in the order we're going for now, if you like, or unless somebody wants to jump in. Uh, I was going to put you on the spot, Frank. Yeah, okay. Um, I think a, a core question here where um, probably we need to have a scientist who has a knowledge of economics, of engineering, of sociology, of psychology, neuroscience, uh, bringing all this together because it's... I think it has to do with um, issues of, of utility, and you want to maximize your utility. It has to do with attitudes, how you look at things and how attitudes are influencing your travel behavior. It has to do with your habits, I think, so because we are very, uh, in a sense, um, linked to our habits. And always a good example is if uh, after the break or after the session to, uh, today and you will re return tomorrow, you probably will sit at exactly the same place where you're sitting now. So because it's a habit, uh, you, you do this. So it's really strange. And it's also, I think, a, a bit of a social practice. So if it's like becoming more and more accepted by everybody, then I think this is also uh, adding to the fact that um, the modal shift and the modal change can be uh, more beneficial. So in a sense, if I look, for instance, at the bike sharing system, then I think there are three key elements here because that's all the theories we have. And then we see that all of the theories there, they're adding something to the discussion, but they're not solving the problem. And maybe we are making it too difficult. And I think in order to have a good um, a, a shift towards, let's say, more active travel, I think three things need to be there. It needs to be fun, it needs to be easy, and it needs to be the norm. 
And if you then look at the bike sharing system and you see in some cities where it's enormously complicated just to get access to the bike, city, the bike sharing system, then that's not fun. So it should be very easy, and if you drive, uh, obviously if you ride your bike and you see like this is really great, and it's if, an, if it's an electrical bike, then it becomes also fun. And if you see more and more people doing this, then it becomes a norm. So I would say focus on these three elements. Mm -hmm. Fun, easy, and let it become the norm. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, Frank, for, for the systematic uh, answer. Uh, and in order it to become a norm, uh, you also really need this uh, physical supportive infrastructure that, that actually allows everyone from uh, 8 to 80 to access and, and, and uh, move through the city uh, with bikes or, or by walking or with active travel modes. So, so we, we know the concept of value action gap. And, and we might have uh, the attitude that, of, of course, we prefer uh, cycling and walking, but if the infrastructure does not support that very systematically, um, mm -hmm. we, we don't change our behavior. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that this bike sharing system, which, has been, which was established in Tartu three years ago, it, it's an excellent example. It's, it's, just, it's really a great example how you create a city-wide infrastructure which actually affects the behavior of people because it's accessible and, and it forms a network of docking stations you can reach everywhere uh, with that uh, and regardless of, of the aim of your trip. And it also includes the electric vehicles, you don't need about sweating so much, for example, like these kind of very, very simple practicalities which makes things fun or do not make it uh, to, be a, to be a fun, uh, fun aspect. And this has in turn created the demand for even more better infrastructure, for even better urban space, and also have, has given voice to, to those people who actually prefer walking and, and cycling, and also uh, want their children to have the freedom uh, to use their own travel mode and be independent in, in the mobility. So the, the, the things, different things working in a combination. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I pretty much agree with what has been said. Um, and I don't know. Um, I, I think you're, you're being too kind to us in, in Tartu. Um, so I, I work for the city government, so, so I can kind of speak, speak for the city. Um, and I, I think the, you know, the main point that resonated with me, uh, with what you just said, is, is one, you know, it has to be really easy uh, to use. Sustainable modes of travel really, you know, it has to make sense for people to use it. We know from successful examples that you know, those are the main motivations. It's easy, it's the quickest, it's the it's, I don't know, cheapest, practical, uh, practical uh, considerations. Uh, it, it's quite rare for people, for, for a lot of people to, to cycle, for example, just because of, I don't know, ideological reasons. And, and to achieve that, I think, again, it's the, the approach has to be holistic in the sense that you, you can't just focus on space, you can't just focus on, on uh, I don't know, uh, financial measures. Uh, you have to do it all. Uh, it's, it's a really difficult task to, to change mobility behavior. Uh, you know, we are trying and coming up short uh, so far. Uh, so, so it really needs to be a really thought through, uh, you know, holistic approach. And, and that's, I think, what's missing in Tartu right now. Uh, the, the things you, you listed, um, you know, they sound impressive, and they are impressive uh, to some extent, but uh, looking at them another way, they're quite kind of marginal. Uh, I think some really core, core measures, core, core questions have been unanswered. For example, physical space. Um, I disagree that we have a good cycling network. We don't. Um, uh, we, we haven't really addressed the kind of main streets, which are still really, uh, you know, heavily car, car based. So there's there's a lot of these, uh, you know, branches missing from our approach, I think. Um, and and that's you know, that's that's what we we're trying to move towards. That and it's and it's a really interesting time to talk about this in Tartu, because we had a really ambitious project uh, to turn the biggest street of the city uh, to, to really change the, the, the street space there. Uh, it's, right now it's uh, two car lanes in each direction. We wanted to change one lane in each direction into a cycle lane. And you know, this is the biggest street, uh, the heaviest trafficked street 
and it was it was you know all going to plan. We wanted to. It was a temporary intervention for like four months. It was all going to plan, and then ten days before the start, uh, city government decided to scrap the idea. Um, so it, it's not happening now, and and that's I think it was a really good lesson of what was missing in our approach, and and that's. Uh, like communication and engagement. I think those have, uh, in this year, that have been working in city government, those have really risen to that kind of, or kind of be, uh, come into focus uh, for us, because it's really, really difficult to uh, create change if you don't have at least some measure of public support. Um, it, in, in those cases, the kind of uh, bar for, for proof and for evidence that what you're doing is, is, is right becomes ridiculously high, uh, so high that you can't really achieve it because mobility is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we want to make it as evidence-based, as data-based as, as, as possible, but at the end of the day, it's a social science. It, it involves uh, uh, human behavior, which is always, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the core, it's it, it's context dependent. There's no kind of power rules, or there's there's few power rules. So, uh, so, so in that sense, we've really realised that you know engaging with people uh, deeply, uh, having discussions, uh, going to them, asking for their opinions, explaining what we are doing, kind of creating these uh, outside supporters outside of the organisation is really really crucial uh, to. To, to kind of reduce the political risk of getting something wrong, uh, so that if even if you you know uh, there are some setbacks or, or mistakes, so you couldn't foresee everything, it's you know it's kind of soft the, the blow. Uh, so yeah, uh, communication and engagement are really. No, that's a really good point. For for many cities, it's been a challenge. To, there's a fear of letting something out and then pilot testing it and learning from the experience rather than trying to get everything up front right and that takes way longer and usually leads to things not happening very easily. But Malen, um, uh, Denmark has been thinking about this for a little bit longer, so yeah. about your experience. Yeah, I would say this is actually a really difficult question for me to answer short. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing research on everyday mobility practice for 20 plus years, why we use different modes of transport and its connection to policy and planning. Um, and the other thing is I'm at Aalborg University campus Copenhagen, so a lot of my research has been in Copenhagen who has a lot of cycling. And I should say that Copenhagen has like almost 70% of Copenhageners use their bike for work or education. But car ownership is rising and driven kilometers are rising as well. And right now biking is declining because even if they don't use the car for work, then they use it for leisure time. And among the young people, the joke is now that you have to get yourself a summer cottage because then you have an excuse to buy a car. Um, and I think one of the things that is the major mistake is that we spend at least 100 years, at least the last 60, it was really massive to get the car in to be an essential everyday uh, thing that we all have a right to do. And now we start talking about active green mobility and then we do a few things and we don't understand why it doesn't work. Uh, which is basically, um, sometimes I'm using the example of, I have a, a little bit of this feeling being a small boat with a green uh, sail, they're waving at a super tanker saying, can you please turn around now because we need to do something for the environment. And I think we need to take that seriously. Seriously. And I also think um, that there is one way, and that is putting in restrictions for cars. We don't get the last mile, we don't get the last things done if we don't put in restrictions for cars. Because people want their everyday life to work and they do it exactly the same time every day. You are going to place yourself in the same almost the same space tomorrow, you are going to do your morning routines in the same way every day, or your life doesn't work, your everyday life doesn't work. When we take away the car, people have to rethink their everyday life. They're not happy about it. Um, so I think it's actually, it's a big super tanker that we have to turn around and finding ways of um, reclaiming space for something else than cars. In a city like Copenhagen, we have a lot of bike paths, we have a lot of parks. It's 54% of the uh, common space in the city is used for cars and parking. 
Uh, I think I was so happy with that number came out this last year. It's the first time the number has ever been official. I've been asking about it a million times because that number was never made. Um, and I was thinking today in a lot of the presentations I saw there was so much about this, like this trip links to things we do. We always talk about cars as essential because of commuting. It's only 30% of the trips. So there's so many stories that the work that you do here, which I don't do because I am a qualitative researcher, but when I'm sitting here listening to all the research, I'm thinking there's so many opportunities of starting to visualize what is it actually we're doing with this thing that is not really good for the, the environment, it's not good uh, in relation to if we want to reach any kind of goals, it's not good for um, the, the, it's not good for health, it's not good for um, <coughs> The, what is that called, the socio-economic situation. So there are so many arguments for doing active green mobility and that basically goes right into this thing about communication because what is it that we're communicating? It's not about telling people what it would be better that they did. It's basically also about convincing the politicians that this is an economically viable and very clever decision to make and that they're not going to lose voters on it. Because that's such a big part that political in Copenhagen, I'm, I'm going to stop now, in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. the planners are really good at basically grabbing a little bit here and grabbing a little bit there because it's also difficult to get the big decisions in. So they take a little bit of sidewalk, they take a little bit of a bike path, uh, but they also know that the biggest problem is getting it through the political system. It's not stranding at the planning level, it's stranding at the politician level because the minute there is anything that affects the car, the answer is almost always no. Um, this is also how it works in a city like Copenhagen that claims to be the city of cyclists. Yeah, I mean, talking of communication, it was interesting to see here in Tartu to the backlash to the Ria Street uh, decision. And uh, after the fact, we, we saw community action, uh, people actually just guerrilla style going to ride the route anyways and to show. And one can just wonder whether uh, some better communication up front would have made a difference um, in the political decision making rather than the backlash. Um, I, I should also emphasize, I'm actually really in, uh, impressed to see myself that this conference and the research we see um, um, has um, somewhat transitioned from general sort of mobility and behavior analysis that can be large scale and aggregate uh, and rather abstract sometimes to specifically several projects focusing on mobility on the more sustainable modes. There seems to be an ideological difference that we need to also direct the research in the direction like you were just mentioning that actually can make a policy difference or, mm. or provide support for, for real world mm. decisions. Mm. Um, so I, I want to transition to a second question, which is uh, probably the, well, I know that it's not unique to Tartu, it's not unique to Estonia, but it's something that is really hard to grapple with for city government in particular, which has to do with uh, multiple municipalities. Uh, in Estonia in particular, uh, city centers are, are one municipality and usually transportation uh, and various other services are operated therein, but all cities now function as larger or smaller metropolitan areas, Tartu uh, uh, very much so. And in fact, one of the biggest contributors to the rising vehicular mode share is, are trips coming into Tartu from adjacent municipalities that are not connected well by bus or by rail, et cetera. And uh, we have very little chance of having municipal reform again because we just tried uh, to some extent. So what are your thoughts in terms of um, how issues of sustainable mobility can be addressed at the cross-municipal level uh, when we don't have a good model of metropolitan governance in Estonia. We don't have metropolitan governments that have any financial or administrative power, really. Uh, the county level is very weak. Um, and, and many cities around the world struggle with this, I'm fully aware. But what, what are your thoughts that could, because it seems rather key to making a difference, because it's, again, the, your analogy to a, a sailboat, to a tanker, well, it's also uh, one little municipality surrounded by 20 others mm. uh, can't necessarily uh, uh, solve the bigger picture alone, right? So what could be done to better coordinate uh, across municipal boundaries uh, because, because of this mobility patterns we see in the data really take place at a totally different scale than the, where, where the governance is? Mm. We could go uh, yeah, in a different yeah. order. Yeah, mm. uh, sure, there are also, like, it's also a super difficult questions, uh, question and, and uh, there are so many stakeholders involved in that. 
in, in that part. But I would still start from the uh, experimentation that we don't have in Tartu, <laughs> uh, and, and perhaps some other, uh, some other uh, developments that are uh, in the planning phase uh, currently, but, but again, uh, because of the lack of political will, they might not happen, even if they would really make a change in the urban landscape. So, so once people have this experience through experimentations, for example, uh, they have their own experiment, uh, ex experience with that, then they actually understand that it's, it's not so hard to change my practices. Mm. It actually works. Or if there are these regulative uh, norms that, that you mm. cannot access mm. uh, uh, by car mm. certain spaces, uh, so that also changes this, uh, this behavior and it also creates a demand uh, on the real estate market that I want to buy a house uh, in a location where I can actually uh, go by other means of travel than car. Mm. And, and not only me, but my whole family and my friends can come and visit and I can go to a bar or a theater in the evening and then just go back with some other mode of uh, travel than a cab or a car. Mm. Uh, and and if, this, if this comes through this personal experience, uh, a demand on the real estate market, then perhaps also the local municipalities, those who are in the in these sprawled areas, they, they can also provide uh, this. Or they, are, uh, they see that, uh, that having a very good public transit connection and, and the cyclic network with the center, uh, of the city is is actually a benefit for their own uh, people mm -hmm. and they start to communicate that one as well mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah um, i uh, i think i agree to some extent but i think it's th this there's often this narrative uh at least in tartu that it's it's those kind of uh Kind of um, bad surrounding municipalities who are who aren't you know thinking about uh, Tartus uh, citizens and are just building you know residential areas without access to to jobs and services uh, around Tartu and and flooding Tartu with cars, um, which you know to some extent I, I guess is true, but at the same time you know no one is doing it out of malice. There's there's you know again people do what is convenient, what is practical for them, and and that's where the housing market. Uh, really, you know how, how the housing market works really plays a crucial role uh, because uh, families who want to live in Tartu, um, it's really really tough to find a an affordable and, and big enough uh, uh, resident resi residence. So, so that that is something where you know Tartu ourselves we have uh, we have uh, made some mistakes or we haven't haven't been able to provide uh, you know necessary. Uh, means for people to, to stay in the city and live in the city. Um, but um, I think once people have kind of moved beyond municipal borders, um, you can, uh, you can uh, make them shift modes to some extent. They can cycle, especially with e-bikes, they can use public transport, but it's, it's tough uh, because the distances are longer and, and definitely a bigger share of those people will still Stick with the car uh, compared to, to to urban urban residents. So so then the question becomes: What, you, what do you do? You want to avoid more people, uh, you know, move, moving to these uh, to these uh, uh, places with with bad accessibility. But then the question becomes: What do you do with the ones that are already there? And and there we we do see some solutions. Uh, we, we are our plans are to kind of have these mobility hubs, multimodal mobility hubs on the borders, kind of a I don't know, upgraded park and ride, park and uh, park and pedal uh, facilities. But uh, that's you know again that's tricky because those have been around for for a while and often they don't really work well. Uh, and and it's again where the approach has to be holistic. You have to make sure that it, it makes sense to leave your car on the border and to switch to a different mode within the city. And, and that is not the case if you have you know, plentiful parking, cheap parking in the city centre and, and you know, wide roads, uh, you know, quick access with the car. So, so again, it, it, could be, it comes to this restricting car use, but also you know, with, the, with the other hand, offering an alternative. So, so that is what we are trying to do, we are planning to do. Uh, we'll see if, if it works and how well it works. But again, it's, uh, it, it is easy to see it failing exactly because it's, it's difficult to take away something and to these, these ideas, they're, they're tough to do in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. um, imagine what it's like in Tartu. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but we aren't a, a cycling city uh, yet. 
No, but it's interesting in Copenhagen because we actually managed to do experiments and these experiments actually had a long-lasting effect on our way of designing certain streets in Copenhagen. So after the first experiment, like it is often with experiments, people figure out it's a good idea and suddenly there's a planning strategy that's possible. So, And I think that was very much about a lucky situation and the right political combination of people who dare to do stuff. Uh, so I, I know it's it's uphill, but don't stop trying, I would say. <laughs> um, no, no, we won't. And the other thing, I actually wanted to try to answer that question of what do we actually do to get the, because it is exactly the same problem in Denmark and it has a lot to do with also political economy and the development of a lot of things that we're not going to get into here. But we have the same problem in Denmark. What we started doing um, is basically, I have two research projects now where we're doing it, actually three. Um, one is about sustainable innovative mobility solutions and the other one is about mobility, food and housing practices in the transition of everyday life. All of them is about transitioning to more sustainable um, living. Um, but what we're actually doing, we're starting to do stakeholder workshop and inviting people in. So we as researchers actually take the responsibility of creating these small networks of, for instance, in one of the projects we did it um, with the, our public transport operators are um, on counties, so we have six of them. So we actually started making, it's not that they don't see each other, but we started making small, more intimate events, talking to them, so it became a more open space for them, and suddenly, and that was during Corona, for instance, because they all had serious issue with getting passengers into there. But, but that actually did a lot, uh, and and I don't think it's right that it has to be like that. And I do think there should be a state or a municipal organization of that. I don't think that it should be this way. But this isn't the way it is. So this is the best we can do. And the other project, we are actually trying to both put uh, private and public s stakeholders together within different areas to start this uh, conversation. And I think with my research... It's not the planners, it's not a lot of the people who are actually stakeholders in these um, different kind of energy companies or whatever it is, it is actually very much the politicians. And there is this guy called, I always want to call him Richard Nixon, but that's not his name, I think he's called Denver Nixon, <laughs> um, who, who wrote a couple of years ago that it's not strange that the car is having... Um, such a power when it's uh, uh, white middle-aged men in gray suits who are using the car every day who are making all the decisions about how these things are planned. And I think this is exactly, we, we are in a situation where it is an extremely powerful alliance. And right now we are actually doing, through our research projects, what we can actually do to start making connections. We just put a debate thing in the one of the major newspapers in Denmark on that cycling is not good enough and suddenly we can con connect all the researchers and practitioners because we start doing these networks. I don't think it's the, it should be like that, but right now it seems it's the only thing we can do to start getting some, also to get some voices in there. So we start like also using our voices in, in the press as well and saying, listen, based on our research, we have an issue here if we want to do something in 25, which is too late, but then at least let's try for 30. We need to get moving, and that has to be now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frank, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, well, coming from Belgium and then needing or to give some advice on good governments, knowing <laughs> that we have seven ministers of mobility at different levels, I'm not really sure whether that's... Uh, that's, that's a, an, an easy question to answer, but I think that every level has to play, I think, its role, but mobility doesn't stop at the boundary of the city, it's much, much broader. And you also see this with these new developments like mobility as a service, okay, you can develop it at the level of the city, but then the region is there as well, and then maybe at uh, the country level, and then maybe also at um, cross-border country level. So, in that sense, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated thing, but... Um, at, at least I think like conferences like these and also focusing on good practices 
cities, they're also keen on being considered as a good practice and that they also want to show off in a sense that, uh, well, this is what we have done and look at us and then others saying, well, we can do that as well. So I think that might get the ball rolling, but at, um, let's say, the, the, best, the best level in terms of, of governance, I'm... Um, I'm maybe ill-placed to comment on that. Yeah. It's no, I, probably, I just want to say, it's probably what Big would call sub-politics, and I think this is what we need in this situation, because it's not going to come from the official political level. It has to be sub-politics that are working on different levels. I, and I think it's very much in line with what's yeah. actually happened in Estonia. Yeah. Almost all positive change has come mm. from activism mm -hmm. uh, that eventually mm. ends up in politics, mm. but it starts not in politics. No. Um, but I, I was also encouraged by, okay, what you were saying about maybe differences in, in real estate demand that are starting to occur. Uh, I anecdotally uh, take my um, guidance from friends I, I see occasionally over the years back in Estonia. So 10, 15 years ago, it was considered uh, a, a cool thing to buy a big house in the periphery.